He was brilliant and beloved, remembering and celebrating Robbie Robertson, one of Canada's most influential musicians. Places never been before. Also on this Wednesday night, Paradise in Peril. We just helped everybody I could along the way. The ferocious flames ripping through Maui Island and the desperate measures some people are taking to escape target of disinformation, why the Chinese government is suspected of circulating lies, again, about a conservative MP. Omicron's cousin is spreading what's known about EG.5. And this is them trying. I have my Lucky Charm nail polish on. The struggle to get Taylor Swift tickets. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. We begin with breaking news out of the music world. A member of Canadian rock royalty, Robbie Robertson, has died at the age of 80. The Toronto-born singer-songwriter was lead guitarist for the band and was known for classic songs like The Wait and The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down. He was inducted into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame and he also received the Order of Canada in 2011. Mike Drolet on one of this country's greatest musicians. It's hard to take a single snapshot from Robbie Robertson's career. If there was one, sure, it would be from The Last Waltz, the band's epic Martin Scorsese-directed farewell concert. But he didn't start out there. There were the years in the Hawks, Ronnie Hawkins' backup band, before Bob Dylan poached them. lead his electric revolution away from folk. Well, it taught me to duck because people were booing and throwing stuff at us. But before all that, he was a musical prodigy growing up in Toronto. And while he embraced his mother's Mohawk heritage later in his solo career, there was a stigma to being indigenous in the 1950s and 60s. Advice that I got when I was very young was be proud that you're an Indian, but be careful who you tell. A Virgil Kane is a name As a band, it took time for Robertson and the other Hawks to figure out their identity. The band was really without peer. They were probably the best ever backing band anybody had ever hired. And then they went on to do the, their own thing, and they were great at doing that too. It wasn't until Dylan was sidelined by a motorcycle accident in 1966 that they set out on their own. As a result, the band, 80% Canadian dudes, led by a guy from Six Nations, uh, turned into one of the most important and most influential bands of the late 1960s and early 1970s. I've said before this wasn't a group that had a cute singer with his shirt off and a guitar player and some other guys playing behind them. This was a group that everybody did something so extraordinary that we were all impressed with one another. Robertson never said it, but he carried the burden of leading the band, along the way becoming one of the greatest Canadian songwriters of his era. Mike Trelay, Global News Toronto. You just heard Mike reference Robbie Robertson's creative partnership with Martin Scorsese. Robertson composed numerous film scores later in his career, working with Scorsese on The Raging Bull, The Departed, The Wolf of Wall Street, The Irishman, and their final collaboration, Killers of the Flower Moon, which comes out in October. The director told Deadline this afternoon that Robbie Robertson was one of my closest friends, a constant in my life and my work. I could always go to him as a confidant, a collaborator, an advisor. I tried to be the same for him. There's never enough time with anyone you love and I loved Robbie. In lieu of flowers, Robertson's family has asked that anyone wishing to honor him donate to the Six Nations of the Grand River in Ontario to support a new culture center for the community. To Hawaii now, an apocalyptic scene. Catastrophic wildfires are tearing through Maui tonight. Flames are raging with such ferocity and at such an alarming rate, at least six people are dead and hundreds of structures are destroyed. Maui is the second largest island in the state of Hawaii, and it's a huge tourist destination. Visitors are being asked to leave immediately, and a state of emergency has been declared. The National Guard's been activated to help get people to safety. Jackson Prosco reports on the deadly disaster. With frightening speed, the fires ripped across Maui. 
tearing through the heart of the historic tourist town of Lahaina in just minutes. I'd be surprised if there were no fatalities because this moved quickly, there was no warning, there was no preparation, no one was ready for it. It happened so fast there was nowhere to run. Some made a harrowing escape through the flames, others jumped into the ocean. The U.S. Coast Guard rescued at least a dozen people from the water. I was the last one off the dock when the firestorm came through the banyan tree and took everything with it. And I just ran out to the beach and I ran south and I just helped everybody I could along the way. Hundreds of buildings burnt to the ground. This pilot flew over the devastation and told a local TV station there's almost nothing left. There's not even part of the structures left. It's just, they're just gone. It's erased. It's just, it's like a, like an area was bombed or in like a war zone. The explosive wildfires were fueled by extreme winds from Hurricane Dora far offshore. There was little warning and little expectation it would be this bad. We never anticipated uh, in this state that a hurricane which did not make impact on our islands will cause this type of wildfires. In this popular year-round tourist destination, 2,000 travelers are now stranded at the airport, including this couple from Ottawa. Yeah, our flight was canceled last night, so we're making arrangements to fly out today. Other visitors have spent a long day in evacuation centers looking for a way home. A lot of people have been contacting our office trying to get out as soon as possible. Some people that we know are sheltering in high schools to stay away and stay safe from the fire. So this is concerning on so many levels. The state of Hawaii is now discouraging all non-essential travel to the island of Maui with resources scarce and strained. This is not a safe place to be. On certain parts of Maui, we have shelters that are overrun. Only after the flames are gone can anyone begin to tally the damage in lives and property lost in a paradise forever scarred. Jackson Prosco, Global News. Maui relies heavily on tourism, and Canadians are among the biggest spenders. In the first half of this year, there were more than 1.4 million visitors to Maui, up nearly 6% over last year. And they spent a staggering $3.5 billion. That's up nearly 25% from 2022. Wildfires have also caused heartache and destruction here in Canada, particularly in B.C. Now that the province is earmarking more than $880,000 for 19 communities to develop and upgrade evacuation routes and public notification plans, including emergency alerts. By the time oil finally flows through the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, the pipeline that Ottawa bought, there will be a staggering bill left to pay. Documents obtained by Global News reveal the project is burning through hundreds of millions of dollars each month as costs balloon to more than five times the original budget. Heather Yorks West explains why the cost to build TMX is now far more than what the government can expect to sell it for. Four years since construction on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion first began, the pipe is still going into the ground. The path to this point has been anything but easy. A COVID-19 pandemic and atmospheric river fueled flooding contributing to a cost overrun that dropped jaws. It's, you know, really cost way more than anybody would have dreamed at the beginning. Initially expected to cost 5.4 billion. That number ballooned to 30.9 billion by March of 2023. And money is still being spent. Last year, the project was burning through 600 to 900 million a month, with 875 million spent in November alone. That's a huge cost overrun. Um, something that uh, no engineer, no person in project development uh, could ever say is reasonable. Built to twin a pipeline that's been in operation for more than 70 years, the expansion travels 1147 kilometers from Edmonton to Burnaby through mountain passes and incredibly urban environments too. In this Chilliwack neighborhood, the line passes through a series of backyards. Trans Mountain says external events, which included the flooding in late 2021, only accounted for 25% of the extra money spent. It was engineering overruns that represented the lion's share of the added costs. I think it's really uh, fair to say that this project has been seriously mismanaged. 
And one of the ways we can tell that is by looking at the revolving door of contractors that Trans Mountain has had on the project since they started. Divided into a series of segments, most sections saw the original contractor in charge of construction replaced during the course of the project. And in parts of segment five, between Merritt and Hope, three different contractors were involved. Trans Mountain says its decision to change contractors were based on contractor capacity and performance. Financed with money borrowed from Canada's big banks, backed by federal government loan guarantees, the Crown Corporation hopes to recover construction costs once the oil begins to flow. But based on the contracts signed to ship along the line, this analyst believes those earnings will never be enough. When I do a calculation, I see about $18 billion of that cost increase is going to have no revenue associated with it. Other analyses have calculated the difference at 16 to 20 billion or more. Controversial to some, highly anticipated to others, this national piece of infrastructure has come at an incredible cost. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Conservative MP Michael Chong has once again become involved in what Global Affairs Canada suspects is a smear campaign by China. As Mackenzie Gray reports, it's believed Chong was targeted because of his consistent calls to describe the treatment of Uyghurs a genocide. Clearly, a genocide is taking place in Xinjiang. He's been an outspoken critic of Beijing, and for the second time, Conservative MP Michael Chong was likely a target of Chinese disinformation. They're trying to hurt Mr. Chong's reputation. They're trying to damage his capacity to articulate his views. Global Affairs Canada announcing they detected false narratives about Chong's identity, political stances, and family's heritage on the social media platform WeChat, which is popular with Chinese diaspora. According to the department, the operation took place in early May and saw a coordinated network of WeChat accounts featured, shared, and amplified a large volume of false or misleading narratives about Mr. Chong. Chong was briefed on the operation today, which Global Affairs deemed highly probable to have been ordered by the Chinese Communist Party. This is certainly not surprising to us. Uh, we've been seeing this uh, for almost four decades. Chong and his family had previously been targeted by Beijing in the lead up to the 2021 federal election. Intimidation the MP had not been told about until it was reported in the Globe and Mail. The Chinese diplomat involved in that plot, Zhao Wei, was expelled by Canada in May, at roughly the same time the latest campaign started against Chong. And this could reflect the PRC's way of doing business, which is if you don't get with the program, we'll come back another sneaky way. The newest development in China's continued interference in Canadian affairs comes as the Liberal government is under pressure to call a public inquiry and pass new foreign interference laws ahead of the next election. We shouldn't fall into the trap of inquiry first, legislate later. There is no reason they can't move on legislation now while some sort of inquiry is going on in parallel. While time's ticking on new legislation, it's been dragging on for a public inquiry. Two months on since the Liberals opened the door to holding one, they still haven't come to terms with opposition parties or found someone to lead the review. Farah? Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa for us tonight. Thanks, Mackenzie. Big cities seeing a brain drain. Coming up, how some people are being priced out of their communities and plotting an exit strategy. One thing's for certain, the pandemic radically changed the way we live and even where we live. COVID-19 has had a huge impact on housing markets right across Canada, and it's fueled an exodus from our priciest provinces, with many forced to relocate and plant new routes. As Anne Gaviola explains, affordability has been a driving force. Alberta, Canada. In March, Alberta rolled out a new campaign enticing people to move to the province for better economic prospects. We currently have openings in sectors right across the province. So it's time to put out another call, another call for skilled workers to come to Alberta. A similar ad campaign last year appealed to the Etheridge family. They moved from Keswick, Ontario to Edmonton in search of a better life and a much bigger backyard. In Ontario, we rented a four bedroom house. We didn't have a yard and we were paying 2,600 plus utilities. Whereas living in Alberta, we pay less than $1,800 for a five bedroom house. Like many young families, they felt priced out in Ontario. I couldn't have asked for a better change, to be honest. It has done a whole 360 for our family completely. 
Interprovincial migration volumes plunged in 2020, the first year of the pandemic, but they exploded last year. Alberta saw the biggest spike in newcomers from BC and Ontario, while the maritime provinces welcomed a steady stream of people, mostly from Ontario. Economists say it boils down to housing options, affordability, and job prospects. And that is driving a lot of young people to move farther away from where they started to set up shop, to start a career and to have a family. The most expensive urban centres have seen an exodus of talent. Youth bring that entrepreneurship, that sense of innovation, that ability to create new businesses, bring new ideas to the business world and ultimately to drive economic growth. But housing analysts say this unprecedented interprovincial migration may be helpful as Canada prepares to welcome a record number of newcomers from abroad. Most new Canadians relocate in the Golden Horseshoe in Southern Ontario. So if anything, the out movement of people to other regions of the country is providing something of a, of a relief valve. It's, it's helping keep a lid on uncomfortably high home price appreciation. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. <laughs> Still ahead, what we know about a new COVID-19 subvariant as case counts creep upwards. There's a new COVID-19 subvariant, EG.5. It's a more infectious descendant of Omicron and it's on the rise. It's estimated it already makes up 36% of all COVID-19 cases in Canada. The new mutations been circulating in this country since at least May. As Catherine Ward reports, health officials are once again calling on everyone to mask up and get their booster shot. Today, uh, we will be um, classifying this as a variant of interest. That's EG.5, a COVID-19 subvariant that's being discovered around the globe. It's effectively a cousin of the Omicron variant. Experts say stronger variants and subvariants are to be expected. So that means that this virus, uh, theoretically, can spread more uh, fast, faster and uh, be more pathogenic. But virologists say the new variant does not appear to make people more sick. Epidemiologist Dr. Prabhat Jha says there is no need to panic. The risk seems to be low, but not zero, uh, certainly, uh, of having something really catastrophic as what has happened in the past because we've built up hybrid immunity. Still, public health experts are keeping a close eye on what COVID and other viruses are doing to prepare themselves for the fall. But what we will have, as we did last fall, is we call it a tridemic. We'll have COVID circulating again, we'll have seasonal flu, and we'll have RSV that also causes people, uh, in particular the elderly or the young, to get uh, sick. Experts say getting a booster is one of the best lines of defense. Pediatric infectious disease physician Dr. Jesse Pappenberg is hopeful they will be made available for even the youngest Canadians. Currently in Canada, there's only the only products that are approved for booster dose use are in children five and above. But we expect that by the fall, Health Canada will approve also uh, products for those that are six months of age and above. Until then, experts say washing your hands, using masks and test kits can go a long way. We cannot predict the future, but we can prepare for the future. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Hi. Next, the wide range of emotions among Swifties trying to get tickets to Taylor's Toronto shows. Did anybody get a cold? And if you did get a cold, please just tell me that you didn't because if, if I didn't and you did, I'm just gonna, it's gonna ruin my whole life. Swifties are stressing about advanced tickets for Taylor Swift's era's tour coming to Toronto next year. Ticketmaster released codes to fans who registered in advance, but many diehard fans have now been put on a waiting list. Brittany Rosen has spoken with some lucky and some disappointed fans. Brittany. 
Hi, Farah. From preteens to mothers with children, it seems like everybody across the country is trying to get their hands on these tickets because Toronto is the only stop that Taylor Swift is making in Canada on this tour. And Canadians aren't just competing with the rest of the country, but with Americans who weren't able to snatch up tickets over there and likely international fans as well. And even if you get this magic fan code, there are still no guarantees. Forget Willy Wonka. For Swifties, a golden ticket means getting to see this superstar songstress for her heiress tour next year. To limit bots, resellers, and site crashes, Ticketmaster released codes to fans with staggered purchase times. I've won the lottery already just with the code, right? So the icing on the cake would be the ticket. Diane Fisico signed up as a verified fan and received a code. Her opportunity to book tickets is scheduled for Thursday afternoon. They whisper in the hallway, she's a bad, bad girl. 13-year-old Naomi Wamala and her best friend Zoe Gibson are die-hard T-Swift fans, but will not have a chance to test their luck. Like many, they've been put on the waiting list. I asked like everyone I know to sign up, but no one got, so. It's stressful to try and get tickets, because not everyone's going to get them. Even like Americans are trying to get tickets. Hashtag waitlisted was trending on Twitter as Swifties shared in their frustration. Some of those given a code and opportunity to purchase tickets saw 300 section tickets going for as low as $110, while resellers were already advertising them for just under $3,000. Ticketmaster did not respond to our request for comment. On average this year, Swifties have spent more than $1,700 not only on tickets, but also on accommodation and food. And if you didn't have that fan code, well, you could be out of luck as there have not been any announcements for general public ticket sales. And FARA, even if you try and get them on resale sites, well, they're bound to go for sky high prices. Thanks, Brittany. And that's Global National for this Wednesday night. I'm Farah Nasser. On behalf of our whole crew, I want to thank you for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is this old barn near Mancota, Saskatchewan. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night. <laughs>